Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may have wondered why the presiding bishop is called this meeting today. <laughs> Well, he did so because you who are the Diocese of South Dakota, in concert with the Holy Spirit, have called Jonathan Hunter Foles to be your 11th bishop. I happen to know him. <laughs> Let's see if you are thinking that I'm going to stand up here and tell stories on Bishop Elect Foles, of which I know many. <laughs> Rest assured, I'm not. You see, Jonathan and I have a long standing agreement. And that agreement is this I won't tell stories on him in public. If he won't tell stories on me in public, of which he also knows many. <laughs> During the lead up to your recent Episcopal election, your current bishop, John Cannon, together with the Reverend Dr. Chris Corman, wrote two fine articles on the history and role of bishops especially the Bishop of South Dakota. Dr. Corbin traced the history and rationale of the Episcopacy from the original apostles chosen by Jesus down to the <coughs> present apostles whom we call bishops. Men and women called by the church through the power and inspiration of the Holy Spirit into the apostolic ministry. Bishop Karen wrote specifically and with great affection and wondrous appreciation about apostolic ministry in South Dakota with all its opportunities and all its challenges. He undertook this calling ten and more years ago and he did so even as you would have expected him to. His love for and devotion to the people he was called to serve rang clearly all through his writings. You who are the Diocese of South Dakota were blessed to have had him. And I'm sure that he would declare without hesitation that he was even more blessed have been called by you into this holy relationship and ministry. In my 12 years of driving all over the 66,000 square miles of my home diocese of West Texas, it was not an uncommon experience for me to encounter people who wondered what in the world I did Besides, drive 50,000 miles a year and never go north of Austin. <laughs> and when time would permit, I would tell them. Basically, the work and ministry of anyone who is called to serve as a diocesan bishop in South Dakota or West Texas or anywhere else. Described and defined by three basic responsibilities. These are responsibilities that the bishop and the bishop all have. So let's take them one at a time. First, the bishop is the chief vision pastor for the lives. 
This is the prophetic flow. Now, the bishop can talk with whomever he chooses, and he will. He can elicit input from any number of sources, and he will. But when all is said and done, the vision for the life and ministry of the diocese during his episcopacy is his to proclaim it, and proclaim it he must. Such a vision must be exciting, it must be attractive, it must be engaging, energizing. It must entice people to want to be a part of it. It must call people into an enthusiastic and willing embrace of real sacrifice. Real sacrifice. Real sacrifice, you must remember, is always a gift we make from our very being. It is not a gift we make from our excess. It is not a gift we make from that which we have but do not need. Rather, a gift we make from our very being, which gives glory to God, by being of benefit to somebody else. First and foremost, such a vision must be focused on growing the church, on making the Christ known to those who know him not, of whom there are plenty. Remember, Jesus did not say, go ye into all the world and keep my church small. <laughs> we Episcopalians sometimes are overly enthralled with our quaintness and our coziness, and we use that as an excuse pridefully to proclaim that we don't have a need to talk about numbers. Well, Good Baptist pastor friend of mine said, Yeah, the truth is, you'll just pay and don't want to talk about numbers because you don't have them. <laughs> <laughs> we in our diocese is led by our bishops. Let's always remember. That the church is the only institution in the whole world that exists primarily for those who don't belong to it. They are our reason for being. We are not our reason for being. Those who know not the Christ are our reason for being. We are not our reason for being. So the first task of the vision is to be the vision caster for how together we're going to be faithful to our Lord's command and to go forth into all the world and grow this church. Second task of the bishop is pretty clear. The bishop must be the one to provide primary leadership to access the resources, both human and financial, that are going to be necessary for the diocese to be able to live into that vision. So remember, the bishop cannot lead the diocese into that vision all by himself. He tries to. If he tries to be a Lone Ranger type of bishop, he'll always have control for his best friend. Now, if you go with this friend, you remember that the word Tonto really means a fool. The bishop has 
says, well, and he has to have a lot of it. Number two, Jesus was not a one-man show. He first surrounded himself with a group of seemingly less than stellar companions. He then encouraged them and equipped them through the power of his Holy Spirit to live with him into the vision he was casting. Then, and only then, when they had begun to embrace the vision that he was casting, <coughs> only then did he send them out to make disciples to grow the church. Jesus made apostles, apostles made disciples, and disciples grew the church. In our faith tradition, as Dr. Corbin so clearly stated, we believe that our bishop, and this includes your bishop elect, are direct historical descendants of those first apostles. They're charged by our Lord through that self same spirit, going to all the world claiming the good news of the never-ending love of God for all of his children. Remember that. And number two, just as the bishop must access the human resources that are necessary to live in the vision that he'll have, he must also access the financial resources necessary to live into that vision. In essence, the bishop must be the primary stewardship educator of the diocese, and he must be good at it. For continually, the bishop is going to have to deal with voices proclaiming we're just a poor church. We're just a poor church, a church without resources, adequate. To the vision of these pastors. Oh, we're just victims are so good at that. In our congregations and in our dioceses, we seem always tempted to think poor. And when we yield to the temptation to think poor, then we talk poor. And every time we do that, Every time we think poor and talk poor, we end up acting cheap. Let me let you in on a little secret. Two things. Every bishop of this church already has all the money he or she needs to enable the church to live into the spirit of inspired vision that he or she is casting. Such is surely the case back in the diocese of West Texas, a geographical area just a little bit smaller than the whole state of South Dakota. My diocese includes three of the five poorest metropolitan areas in the United States. Areas covered right covered up right now on both sides of that river with thousands upon thousands of people, political and economic refugees, fleeing oppression and hopelessness and despair in their own countries. The need is so great and the resources seem to be so lacking but the truth is, we in the Diocese of West Texas already have all the money we need to live in our bishop's vision for us. Just as do you who are the Diocese of South Dakota. The truth is, there is no shortage of money amongst the bishop age. Every rector, every priest in charge, every vestry, every bishop's committee in this church already has.
requires all the money they need to enable the church to live into the spirit inspired vision that we have. This is true in your diocese, even as it is surely true in my diocese. So, what's the problem? The problem is, most of that money is still in our pockets. Secondly, he must also access the resources, human and financial, that are necessary to enable the diocese to live into that region. Those are the two fun things that the bishop gets to do. Those are the exciting things he gets to do. But the third thing the bishop has to do is not so much fun. The third task that the bishop is to maintain order. And this the bishop must do. For if he or she does not maintain order in the diocese, there will be no order. Chaos will ensue. And our ancient enemy, the devil, will have a headache. To maintain order, the bishop must be willing and able to hold people accountable, clergy and laity alike. The problem with that is there is nothing at all in the human spirit that causes any of us to rush to embrace accountability. I'm sure it's true for me, and I bet it's true for you too. On several occasions, back when Sandy and I were driving all over the diocese of West Texas, I glanced in my rearview mirror, and I'd see one of our governor's faithful troopers behind me in his cruiser with his lights <laughs> flashing, and he'd pull me over the side of the road, and we'd have a little prayer meeting right there <laughs> on the side of the road. A meeting for which she, which she always led, and for which I always paid. <laughs> Each time that happened, I was reminded yet again that I do not like the experience of accountability. And yet we all know that serious commitment to accountability to mutual accountability is essential to the maintenance of any healthy relationship. Try to maintain your marriage without accountability. Try raising children. Try teaching school. Try supervising a business and, and, and employees. Try to know all your neighbors without accountability. That work. We who are the church really need to remember that we do have an ancient enemy. We often call him the devil, and we visualize him in long red underwear with horns and a pointy tail. Would that he would always be so easily recognizable. First and foremost, we must always remember that our ancient enemy hates the church. He hates the church and he despises the clergy of the church and he is bent upon the destruction of both. Some of his favorite tools for the destruction of both the church 
and her clergy for alcohol, drugs, money, and sex. If you also throw into that nasty mix several goodly doses of self-doubt, false pride, and good old-fashioned sloth, and self-aggrandizement, you'll have to make it so many difficult days for your bishop and the congregations for which he is responsible. Your new bishop will hold you accountable because he must. He will do so because he loves you. And he loves the church that has been entrusted to him. So, all that is what a bishop has to do. That's his job. He has to cast the vision into which he will call the diocese that he is leading. He has to access the resources, human and financial, that will be needed to enable the diocese to live into that vision. And while he's doing all of that, he has to maintain order. Jonathan, my son, and my brother, soon to be my brother, stand up. This is not the first time in your life that I have had occasion to admonish you. <laughs> but God willing, I do believe it's going to be the last. <laughs> By the time this day is done, you will have been ordained three times. Twenty-three years ago, you were ordained a deacon. Twenty-two years ago, you were ordained a priest. Now today, you will be ordained a bishop. Of those three events, those three ordinations, you must always remember that the one that changed your life the most was that first one, the one that made you a deacon. For in that one, the ordination to the diacon, you declared your desire, your intention, and indeed your willingness for the rest of your life. Be a servant. Then, in the due course of time, you responded to the call of your Lord to his church to submit yourself to ordination as a priest. And now today, you're about to submit yourself to ordination as a bishop. Truth is, ordination to both the priesthood and the episcopacy are but subsets of that first ordination, the ordination to the diaconate. For essential to all three, but the one declared first and foremost in your ordination to the diaconate is that willingness, that commitment, first and foremost, to be a servant. I have every reason to believe that you know this great truth. And that you believe this deep in the very core of your being. The office and ministry of Bishop is now to be entrusted to you. Treasure that office. Protect the integrity of that office, but take great care never to equate yourself with the office. 
You know that will remember that years ago, you and I would occasionally play chess, a game which you came to play very well, so well that most of the time you beat me. My final admonition, <laughs> my final admonition to you this day is to remember always that when each game of chess was over, the bishop and the pawn all go back into the same box. <laughs> My daily prayer for you now is that you will continually be filled with utter joy at the privilege of being able to serve in this beautiful and promising diocese. <laughs> and that God, through the power of his Holy Spirit, will keep you safe as you drive mile after endless mile, <laughs> ending 